because uh, <laughs> see, you, you you like these these uh these conversations. That's what I love about them hiding in the background in Zoom and then just like popping on the scene, that type of thing. That's pretty yeah, cool, right? Exactly. And I I, I want to say hello to you right now, but I don't want to be rude. I am gonna look at my camera. I assume that that's what I'm supposed to do. Am I? You, you can talk to whomever. You can talk to me yeah, yeah. on on your screen. You can talk to me in the camera. Just just talk to me. Look, I'm, I'm talking it, to you. A, I'm talking to you two inches to the right, though, just so you. I'm, I am paying That's attention all, to you. Okay. <laughs> that, that 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 works perfect for me. Look, okay, Chris, ahead. I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us um, on the Someone Like Me series by Gatorade Endurance because you're exactly, um, I'm exactly, we are all exactly the reason why. Um, and the, the world of sports has changed so much. And I think it's important to understand and acknowledge those that have been through trial and tribulation in order to accomplish the goals of where they are today and the hard work. Uh, but then also the goals that you've reached. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your, your resume and I'm just completely overwhelmed, like triathlete, six time member of Team USA, you know, catalyst for change for the Olympic, you know, International Olympic Committee policy on transgender athletes. You're the go-to source. I mean, you created transathlete.com. I mean, there's there's so many things that are just baked into this notion of how do you foster inclusivity? I mean, you kicked it off. I mean, so I mean after I mean, and then then I go through the first of the things that you've done. First transgender athlete to represent the United States in international competition. Same. First, ESPN body the issue. Um, first, transgender athlete to qualify for the Olympic trials. I mean, I mean, is it hard to be first so much? Uh, it is hard to be first so much, but also I think I, I take pride in being that first person. Um, initially, like in making Team USA for the first time, I was really nervous about it because I knew that being the first is uncertain, right? Like you don't mm. know what's going to happen. But I was really excited about what that would mean for me athletically and for what it would mean for my community. And so after I did that, you know, being the first is... Uh, for me, it's like, I, I want to see what doors I can break down. I want to see what barriers I can break. So I love being the first. What a, what award after all the things that you've done makes you the most proud? Um, wow. You know, I think it was a USA triathlon sportsmanship award. And I think that that, uh, you know, seeing, being recognized by the endurance community for not only my accomplishments as an athlete, but for you know, my community work. To me, that was really meaningful. So take us all the way back. You know, you, you obviously didn't just wake up and show up where you are right now with all the, the, the championships and with, with all the, the medals and the accolades, right? Uh, how did everything start and how did you find your way to kind of where you are and, and how you got started really in sports? Yeah, I was a team sport athlete when I was a kid. And so like my earliest memories were playing team sports, were playing in the neighborhood with uh, other kids, age of four, mm -hmm. playing t-ball, baseball, softball. By the time I made it to high school, I was a three sport all conference athlete in volleyball, basketball and softball, you know, running nowhere on my radar. Uh, never thought that that would be something that I would do. But by the time I made it to college, I started to have some some. Uh, disconnection between myself and and how I felt on team sports and I didn't really have the words for that at the time but I started to see this sort of growing um, like dislike for being on a women's team mm. and you know I didn't know how to say that but I stepped back from sports at that time and started to just do more individual stuff but what I found during college was that I really missed the the sports environment. I missed what sports brought for me in terms of my community, my friendships, my relationships, and just sort of how I felt about myself in being an athlete. And I, I just didn't get the same thing from being an individual sport athlete at that time. So, you know, when I came out of college, I really wanted to reconnect with the sort of community aspect of sport that I, that I felt like I missed in college. Uh, but I, I needed to do it in a way that felt comfortable for me that felt a little bit safer than having to be on a team and be identified as a woman or or be on a team and have to use a women's locker room or a or, or restroom uh, because that didn't fit for me mm -hmm. and at, at the time I didn't know I was transgender I was I couldn't tell anybody that I didn't know that was the issue but uh, it certainly was and so I started running after college as a sort of way to reconnect with myself to feel better in my own body after some medical issues 
and to, to just try to push myself a little bit. And um, running led to triathlon, led to duathlon, led to race walking, and, and here we are today. <laughs> wait, wait, is, is race walking, you can, I always wanted to ask, him, ask somebody this question. You're not allowed to have both feet off the ground at the same time, right? That's race walking. That's race walking, yep. And your front leg has to be straight until it's underneath your body. Um, yeah. Your front leg has to be straight? All right, all right. Is, is it hard to do race walking? Harder than running, absolutely. Absolutely harder than running, <laughs> to me. All right. Yeah. all right, maybe I should take that up instead of doing the, the running, which is like pounding on my knees because I'm thinking about, like, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy, right? So I'm like 230 pounds. I used to play professional football, and I'm getting out there trying to run five miles, and it's it hurts my knees. So maybe I just need to do a little bit more race walking. Maybe you need to get on a bike or in the pool, I think, actually. <laughs> I think race walking is still pretty hard on the body. Definitely. So, so you're, you're, you're transitioned both mentally as well as physically into this world of, of sports. Um, was there a, a moment in time where everything all of a sudden clicked when everything sort of just came together where you weren't reclusive, if you will, but you moved forward, you know, and you kind of took the next step to be a little bit more vocal about what you believe and how you want other people to be able to be to feel in the sport that you love to play yeah i mean i guess the there were many moments where you know things sort of clicked in in hindsight i can see all of these pretty clearly at the moment i didn't know this was sort of happening but uh when i made the decision to publicly transition and to tell my teammates that i was trans i think that was one moment where you know i thought i could fly under the radar here and and not tell people i could uh, step back from competition and and actually when I realized that I was trans when I had the terminology to put to my identity and wanted to transition I delayed my transition for over a year and a half because I was terrified that I was going to lose my ability to participate in sports because I just didn't see transgender people playing sports and I didn't see them playing at a high level and I had never seen a trans man competing with men and that's what I wanted to do that's the category that I knew I belonged in and I just didn't know if it was possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the moments were, you know, telling my teammates and, and building that confidence and that courage to do that and then having a good reaction from them and getting more confidence from that so that I could tell, you know, the sports organizations and the leagues and the teams that I was playing with that I also needed them to change, uh, you know, their categories for me, to change policies and things like that. So that was one. And then making Team USA and, and being out in that sort of public... Um, you know, beyond my, my sphere in New York City to being out on a national level, I think that was another big moment where, you know, I knew that there would be media attention. I knew I would be challenging the International Olympic Committee policy. I knew it was going to be a big deal. And it took um, not just the training and the effort and the mental preparation, you know, to physically perform to make the team, but also a lot of mental preparation to mm. put myself in a position where, uh, you know, I would be under scrutiny and people would be talking about me and, and being that public figure around a, a topic that, that isn't necessarily embraced, you know, particularly in, in, the, in the United States, um, you know, transgender people are portrayed as monsters, we're portrayed as, uh, the you know, we are the targets of discrimination and harassment. And, and that's largely by the way that the media portrays us or the way that people think about us. Um, so I knew that I would have an opportunity to then use my position as an athlete to help sort of change the narrative around that. What did, um, what did your teammates first say to you? <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, you know, my experience in coming out with my teammates who were largely um, straight as far as I knew and cisgender, so they didn't have any other trans teammates, uh, you know, they told me, like, we love you as a teammate. We love you as a coach. We respect you. And whatever we need to do, like, just let us know. And so it was the most like nonchalant response when I came out, which I was not expecting. I was sort of mentally prepared for, uh, for a lot of resistance. Uh, and, and a part of that is just by the nature of the inherent homophobia, transphobia, and sexism that exists in sport. And then also within our society, you know, even though I was in a city, even though I thought, you know, it's, it's probably going to go better in New York than it's going to go in Idaho, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I was very nervous about how, how my process with them would go. So they were just like, 
we love you. Like, cool, we can change pronouns with you. It's not a problem. And they immediately, you know, adapted to seeing me as a male teammate, as a male coach, uh, competing with the men, and it was not a problem. So I was very surprised and, and very happy that that was my experience. I, I think that's the, the, the most important you know, part of the story is the fact that your, your, teammates, your teammates embraced you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and and I'd, I'd imagine that may not be the same story for, for so many other people like you're talking about, dependent upon where they live or dependent upon the community that they might be a part of. I mean, uh, you know, even you know, as an athlete who traveled and lived in different places, you know, just as a child, just trying to fit into a new community, let alone let someone know that, uh, you know, I'm transgender. It, it, there, there are. There are leaps of which we need to grow as people in order to accept all, and, and sometimes it, it takes a minute. But it's phenomenal that your your friends and your teammates were able to accept you. But as you started to compete, I'd imagine there was probably some barriers, um, and maybe other people that didn't necessarily accept you as much as some of your teammates. And you know, you just talked about the the Olympic Committee. You know, you had to fight against them too. So. You know, take me through some of the stories of the people that pushed back or maybe said things and then also, you know, working, you know, towards your goals in life and the Olympic Committee. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, I had some really heartbreaking moments outside of my team, but at, at races specifically, but it wasn't my competitors. It was the fans and the spectators that were there. That, mm. that posed the issue. Um, sometimes the volunteers, and sometimes it was purposeful, and sometimes it was accidental. You know, and I think that's the challenging part of navigating this identity is that uh, it is possible to be offensive to me without knowing that you're doing that because people lack a basic knowledge and information about what it means to be transgender, about how mm. to talk about identity. So, you know, I have to specifically remember a race in New York City right after I came out where I was running and a police officer on the sideline who was set up with the barriers um, yelled out as I ran by, is that a guy or a girl? And, you know, for me, it's like, also, why does it matter? Like, he's not racing with me. It's not like I'm going to beat him in the age group and he's going to, you know, like he has no, no skin in the game at all. But for him to say that, you know, really took me mentally out of my performance and out of what I was doing, because that had been my experience my entire life. And a lot of times that question was also sort of loaded with a tone of uh, inherent violence attached to it. That if people couldn't figure out my identity, and if I was a guy or a girl, that, that they would be violent towards me. And that would put mm. me in a really dangerous situations. Um, whereas, you know, when I was growing up, I it didn't matter to me if people said that, like I was very secure in myself and, um, you know, I probably at some, at some points in being perceived as a little girl loved when people assumed that I was a guy. <laughs> so, you know, I had sort of mixed feelings about that, but that was, uh, you know, a couple of cases where the, that would happen at races, but not with my competitors. And that was what I really loved about sport and, and being in sport was that, you know, largely when I showed up at the starting line with the men, no one was looking at me like I didn't belong. Mm. Um, you know, whereas my experience before transition was I would be lined up with women and I would just be so nervous that they were looking at me like, you know, what are you doing here? And I would also be like, yeah, I don't know. What am I doing here? <laughs> like, this is not where I belong. <laughs> and that felt really unsafe to me. Um, not because the other women made it unsafe, but because I knew that that wasn't where I belonged. Um, so, you know, I think that I found a lot of safety and sort of peace in my transition in the sports environment, I had a couple of cases where, you know, people accidentally said something. Um, my first race as male was an Ironman race. My mm. first Ironman ever. I just got done with 11 hours and 30 minutes, 28 minutes of, of, <laughs> of racing. And I crossed the finish line and the volunteer, you know, it wasn't the big voice on the microphone, but the volunteer giving me my medal said, congratulations, you are an Iron Woman. And I just melted. Like I was just so upset because it was my, you know, first race as as male, the first time that I'd done an Ironman. That's a lot of effort. It was my first race that I ran with my shirt off. You know, like there were so many big moments of of significance in my athletic career and my career or like my my identity that it was just heartbreaking to be 
not seen as the way that I see myself in that moment. It was also a learning lesson because I sort of gave myself like the two minutes to be really, really pissed about it and then thought, you know, that's on them. Like there's nothing that I could have done to make them see me the way that I see myself or the way that I know that I am. Um, that's, that's a them problem. That's not a me problem. Hmm. And, you know, that was a, a huge moment actually for me and how I deal with situations like that because I had put so much effort in, and that was such a significant moment for me in sports that I didn't want that to be what overshadowed, you know, all of the accomplishment in that day. So, so walk me through that, that two minutes of anger, um, how you mentally went through that. Cause I can only imagine you've prepared yourself several times over. Yeah. Um, and there's so many people, you know, I, as an African American man going into the cycling world, there's not a lot of people that look like me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the guy next to me. I'm looking at the woman next to me. I'm looking at the, 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 the teen in front of me. I'm like, Hey guys, what's up? And they're looking at me like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's all these stereotypes that are um, encased in these endurance events. I played professional football. I look around, I see a bunch of my brothers. Right. Right. So in the cycling moment, I have to, find a way to mentally take myself to another level so I don't either presume or stereotype even the person to think that they are thinking something about me. So how did you deal with that moment, right? That, that two minutes of anger and what steps did you work through? Because I'd imagine there's a lot of people out there right now that are listening to this that are saying, that's what I need in order for me to get through that moment so that I can reach the same levels that Chris has and that I can be better um, uh, than the rest of them. Yeah, I think I had trained my entire life probably for that moment. I feel like for you know most of my life, I saw myself in one way and the way that the world reflected that back to me didn't match how I saw myself. And so I had so many moments of disappointment and of frustration or of upset of me knowing who I am deep down inside, presenting that person or a version of that person to the world you know, pending my own safety and having people not reflect that back to me. And that's really what I thought that that moment was, was sort of just a very important moment of that happening. Uh, but I had dealt with that sort of situation time and time again, just not at that scale. And so I think what I did was I, I remember sitting down because I was exhausted, looking at the food that they gave me, thinking, you know, like, can't possibly put this in my body right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to catch my breath and thinking, you know, this, uh, there's nothing that I could do differently in this moment, right? Like I just, in the last five, 10 miles of running a marathon in an Ironman race, I was constantly thinking about the significance of my identity. And I can mm. say now in, in my races, I'm not always thinking about being trans. I'm thinking about kicking ass. You know, I'm not, <laughs> so I, that, that shifted. You're just away. thinking about winning. Let's go. Let's exactly. win. <laughs> So it's shifted a little bit, but I, in that moment, was thinking, you know, this is a hard race, and, and, but it's not, it's not a pain that is, um, it's, it's different because I paid money to do this race. You know, I paid a lot of money to do this race. This is voluntary suffering, right? This is not as hard as me living my life every day as a trans person. Doing an Ironman race is nothing compared to, to me just existing in the world and some of the pain and, and the hurt that I had felt up to that point in identifying wow. as trans and having interactions with the world. You know, and so that's, I, I put it in that context of saying, like, I signed up for this. I paid a lot of money for this. I chose this, you know, and so this race is nothing. Like, I can make it through this because I make it through my life every day and I wake up smiling again the next day ready to go and do it, you know, and I want to be that example for other people. So... In that moment, I, that, that was honestly a huge shifting point in the way that I've dealt with every other situation since then to say, this isn't about me, that's about that person. And what other people think of me is none of my business. That's it. Like, I can't control what you think about me. The only thing I can do is I can control how I react, how I respond, and, and what I put out into the world. And so that was a moment where I was like, okay, like that sucked. And clearly 10 years later, I'm still talking about it. But that moment really shifted things for me where I could say, okay, moving forward, like all I can control is, is me and my response and how I react. 
and and that's what I want to do in a in a way that I think leaves a legacy for other people. You know, when they look to this and say like I can do that too. I can respond. Mm. You know, not with anger, not with violence, not not beating myself up. Because for years I would beat myself up when people would call me she. You know, after I transition, mm. if somebody would misgender me, uh, somebody would say something or question my identity, I would think that I was doing something wrong. Like, it's my fault. But, you know, that, that, that situation, that moment, you know, made me realize, like, it's, it's not my fault. Like, I'm just me and I, and I can be awesome just like this. And I can live a very happy life and a successful life and accomplish great things. And other people can think whatever they want. That's not my business. Wow. Um, powerful. I mean, in, in, this, uh, in this speaker series, um, someone like me, it, so many amazing just nuggets of, of hope, inspiration, but then also just life lessons in terms of how we can all ultimately... Uh, just just be better but it wasn't just the moment after you finished your race you had to continue or you've had to continue that fight right yeah. and so with the you know with with the international olympic committee they didn't necessarily want you to compete and you had to go fight that battle too how do you mentally go from you know you as a child you go through your transition as an adult people all around you and now you want to go to the world stage you know how how do you overcome that barrier and how do you step over it with sort of your back upright and your head held high um in those moments when so many people are around you i'm sure are just trying to push you down and for me it's always been about thinking you know of course i want to accomplish great things as an athlete i'm a competitive person i want to do my very best but also at a certain point it became well beyond me. And I saw such a huge opportunity for me to be the person that I needed when I was younger, to be the role model that I wish that I had, the person that I wish that I had seen, because we all want to see a reflection of ourselves in the world, in the places of success that we want to go. And it's incredibly challenging if we don't have those role models or those people to look to, you know, just to say like, it can be done. Right, like you in cycling. Yes. If you saw other cyclists that look like you, you wouldn't have a second thought about it, right? But when you're out there being the only one, being the first in a race, being you know a- alone, it-, it can make you question your own greatness or mm. your own <clears throat> ability. And so I want to be that person that I wish that I had when I was a kid growing up. And so doing something like challenging the International Olympic Committee wasn't necessarily about me getting to the Olympics. Uh, at that time, you know, duathlon is not an Olympic sport. I was going to the world championship, which is governed by IOC rules. And so like, I, I knew I wanted to compete in the world championship. I wanted to be the first there. I wanted to break that barrier. But also, I just want to open up the possibilities for other people in my community. And I want to be the person that some young kid can look to and say, no, I can be my authentic self and continue to play the sports that I love. And I don't have to compromise any part of my identity. And just to be that person, I think, is a, is a really powerful moment. And that's really what I frame so many of my decisions around and how I'm going to show up in the world and the information that I'm going to put out and, and how open I'm going to be about my identity and my experiences, um, you know, creating transathlete.com because I want to be that person to open up those doors so that other people can achieve their greatness. It's the legacy. Absolutely. And it's uh, creating the path. Even though some people think that, uh, you know, they, they always say when you're young, you think you're blazing a trail. And when you're older, you look back and you realize it's just a beaten path. In this case, there was no path. Yeah. So, so. I, uh, I, I, I shun that, that quote and I say, now you've established a new, new path and hopefully other people will walk and they have. Um, how, do you think, how do you think the endurance community, you know, can be different? I think that... You know, there's a, there's a difference between fitting in and belonging. And there's a difference between fitting in and feeling like you actually belong, like you are embraced, like this is a place for you. Um, you know, we have a hard time fitting in if we don't see people who look like us. Uh, you know, but anybody could, could maybe adapt, like, you know, I'm a runner. I show up at running races. I show up at my running group. And so I'm, we can all bond over that and I fit in, right? Mm-hmm. But I might not necessarily feel like I belong, like I'm being accepted and embraced for not just the running part of me, but for all of me, you know, for all of the, the differences that I bring to a group. 
And so I think the endurance community can really step up by just creating more space for people to really just be themselves. Um, we need more people, more role models, more examples, more reflections of ourselves. We need more diversity on magazine covers and on billboards and in sponsorships and in ads. You know, we need not just during diversity month, not just on Trans Day of Awareness, we need to be in all places, in all spaces at all times because we are out there. We're out there. There are, there are a lot of transgender athletes. And it's not just that, they're, that we're coming out of the woodwork right now because it's you know, popular or you know, pe because people see me. It's that we're opening up the spaces. Race directors are making policies. You know, they're seeing more opportunities because other people are doing it. And so you know, I would just say like that members of the LGBTQ community, trans people, we've been existing for years, for decades. Mm -hmm. We've been competing. We've been part of all sports. You know, I think endurance sports can just open up those spaces to embrace all of our identities. And not just like, a, I don't care who you are outside. When we're here, we're all just runners, right? But like, you know, I love that I'm a queer runner. I love that I'm a trans runner. And I love that I can show up and be all of that and, and that people will love me for it. So I think we just need more spaces like that where people don't have to hide parts of who they are in order to fit in, but they can actually feel like they belong. I love that. I just keep saying I love that. I love that because there's just so many things I love. Everything you're talking about. Um, what do you wish? You know, what do you wish you knew when you started that you know now? Or would there another way to ask the question is, would you have done anything differently than than you did? Um, how how would you have changed things? Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing is that. 10 years ago when I came out, when I first started this process, it was an entirely different world in terms of how we talked about LGBTQ identity and specifically about trans people. Like we didn't have trans people represented positively in the media. You know, now we have M Emmy nominated transgender actresses and we have, you know, representation in all different levels. So we didn't have that at that time. And I think I spent a lot of time worrying about what other people would think of me and then creating these scenarios about how my interactions with them might go. And that went from everywhere, from the workplace, my friends, my family, my sports community, you know, everywhere. I spent a lot of energy creating these sort of stories and playing out scenarios about how my coming out process might go or how a race might go if I show up and people find out I'm trans and mm. on and on and on. And can you imagine the energy that that takes to do that every day on top of actually living a real life, but to, to make this sort of fake scenario um, of what it might be like. And what I didn't realize or didn't know was how well it would go for me in sports to be a queer person openly out, you know, in, in a relationship, to be trans and to show up and still be embraced and, and not only embraced, but, but really loved by my sports community. And I didn't know that that would be a possibility for me. And I think if, if I would have known that earlier, I could have saved a lot of energy, a lot of time, and probably would have just shown up as myself, uh, you know, earlier without having to wait that year and a half of really laboring over it and, and trying to decide if it was worth doing. So you, you've said a lot and I've said, wow, so many times, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you were to distill it down, um, you know, what do you want to share to encourage other endurance athletes or those interested in you know, joining the sport who feel like they don't belong. Um, what, how do you want to encourage them? What do you want to say to them? What's, what's some final things that you think about that they need to really start to ingest and internalize and then live? You can be your authentic self and continue to play the sports that you love without having to compromise any part of your identity. And you do belong. I'm proof. And so if I can show up and be my authentic self, I know that people around the world don't have to hide who they are. And you, you should never limit your greatness to make other people feel more comfortable. What inspired you to participate in this conversation with Gatorade Endurance? I think we need to have these conversations. I think we need uh, platforms for unique stories, for... Uh, actually, I should should rephrase that. It's not even unique stories. It's stories that are being undertold or, or not given attention. 
And, you know, there are so many people in the LGBTQ community who participate in endurance sports, who, who, who love being a part of this community, who just aren't seeing representation at this type of level. And so this opportunity was really exciting to me because it is a platform to share, you know, not only my story, but also talk about our community. And people need to see that. They want to see that. And I think it'll make them feel more connected to endurance sports to know that they can be exactly who they are and that they'll be loved and embraced and supported on a platform like this. You said earlier uh, that your motto, uh, well, I'll take it as your motto, right? Uh, be who you need, be who you needed when you were younger. Right? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> be, who you need, be who you needed when you were younger. So let me ask you this question. Who are you and who are you that you needed to be? I am an out, visible, transgender man, a member of the queer community who is living a happy and awesome and successful life, doing exactly what I love. And I'm doing that on my terms. And I'm doing that so that other people know that they can do it too. Chris, uh, this has been one of the most phenomenal conversations that I just want to say thank you for joining the Someone Like Me speaker series by Gatorade Endurance. Thank you. I mean, your story is incredibly powerful and I just, you know, I just want to say thank you. And, and to Gatorade Endurance who dedicated to foster, who's dedicated to fostering inclusivity in sports, it works to fuel by amplifying these important voices and stories. We hope to inspire individuals to explore endurance sports because they see someone like themselves, like Chris in the space. So Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us and um, um, thank you for telling your story. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun.